Greetings viewers! This is the second video in a three-part series examining the issue of transgender athletes in sports. Links to the first and third parts are in the info box. In this video, I'd like to look over some of the scientific literature on the topic of trans athletes. I can't touch on all the relevant signs, of course, but here are some vital points to consider. The participation of trans athletes in sports is one of those wonderful areas of human experience where raw intuition tends to get awkwardly questioned by strict methodology. Most people in the end don't really care about the strict measurement of these things because the perception of advantage can seem so obvious. I mean, just look at this weightlifter. It's obvious. Trans women athletes as a group have a biological advantage. I mean, look, it's, it's science. But keen-minded viewers will remember that watching videos of trans people winning competitions is not numbers. So let's take a look at the numbers. In my personal study, the best paper I found that addresses this topic is this overview by Jones et al, published in Sports Medicine. It approaches the topic from several different angles and many of the papers that I'll be discussing are referenced by it. Early on in the paper, we read the kind of conclusion that makes for snappy debating material. Currently, there is no direct or consistent research suggesting transgender female individuals or male individuals have an athletic advantage at any stage of their transition, and therefore competitive sports policies that place restrictions on transgender people need to be considered and potentially revised. This kind of broad language may shock some people. Didn't the authors of the paper see that YouTube clip of the trans girl winning a race? How could any researchers honestly claim that there was no athletic advantage for trans women? Well, part of the answer may be in the strict standard proposed by the authors, no direct or consistent research. This highlights a very important point to keep in mind. There is simply very little research that has been done on the most basic aspects of this topic. To my knowledge, there has been no peer-reviewed study comparing the athletic performance of trans women athletes to a randomized sample of their cis peers in any field of sport or across sports in general. I have also personally found no peer-reviewed study measuring participation rates of trans women in sports to see if they are overrepresented. As far as I can tell, there has been one, and only one, study that compares the athletic performance of trans athletes before and after hormone replacement therapy. That study is this one by Joanna Harper, which compared the relative race times of eight transgender women before they transitioned, when they were racing in the male category, and after they transitioned, when they were racing in the female category. The age-graded scores for these runners remained very stable between their transitions, with no measurable statistically significant increase. In other words, a trans woman who competed as a man, and fell within a particular percentile of runners, would fall very close to the same percentile of runners after transitioning and competing as a woman. In some ways, this study seems a slam dunk for the idea that trans women athletes have no advantage, but the restrictions of this study are obviously severe. Eight runners is not a significant population size to test. At least some of the race times were self-reported, and one race time was discarded as an outlier. Some critics might go outside the paper itself to point out that Joanna Harper is a transgender runner, giving her a clear conflict of interest and a possible source of bias in the results. The lessons from this paper, at least for me, isn't that its results are definitive, but rather that it emphasizes the lack of data on this issue. This is not a conclusive study on whether trans athletes have an advantage, but it's the only direct study we have. The lack of data here makes sense, too. There's not really money to be made by studying the performance of transgender athletes, and they are a particularly difficult minority to gather into a testable group. I'm surprised that Joanna Harper was able to find even these eight runners with times to compare before and after their transitions. This single fact alone is what makes these issues difficult for institutions to grapple with. There's simply no direct measurement that shows that trans women athletes have a competitive advantage. That brings us to indirect evidence. Testosterone levels are a tempting metric because measuring testosterone is relatively straightforward and already common in professional sports. We know that testosterone promotes muscle growth and ostensibly that's why we ban doping in sports. But we need to guard against the simplistic view that doping is banned because whoever has more testosterone necessarily has a bodily advantage. I leave it as an exercise for the listener in the comments to explain a more nuanced view why do sports ban doping? More to the point, if athletic standards were as simple as measuring testosterone levels, then there wouldn't be much argument surrounding trans women athletes. While trans women using spironolactone and estrogen tend to have a higher testosterone level than cis women, as shown in this study, 
Testosterone suppressant using ciproterone acetate is highly effective at lowering testosterone levels to the range seen in XX females. So are your levels the same as other females? Negative. Um, my testosterone le levels are actually lower than uh, any female that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Really? So, yeah. So any of the women that I'm actually competing in against, my testosterone le levels are drastically lower than theirs. That last study I mentioned about testosterone suppression is a particularly informative one. For example, the study includes a comparison of muscle mass between XX and XY participants, both those who did not transition and those who did. This figure highlights the nuances that are to be found in this discussion, especially if you compare muscle mass levels between post-transition trans women and XX cis women who did not transition. On the one hand, the average muscle mass of the trans women group is a full standard deviation above that of the XX cis women group. On the other hand, the trans women group falls almost entirely within the range of the XX group and is still measurably much lower than their XY non-trans counterparts. The authors of this paper describe their findings with this paragraph from the introduction. In terms of actual androgen hormone levels, male to female transsexuals after SRS have no competitive advantage over other women. But the effects of prior androgen exposure on muscle mass and strength do carry over, at least for a certain time period, while previous effects on height and the size of feet and hands are irreversible, and this may be a relevant consideration. The discussion section of this paper briefly touches on the limitations of drawing definitive answers to questions of fairness, but also includes the conclusion that it is justifiable that reassigned male to female trans athletes compete with other women, depending on the levels of arbitrariness one wants to accept. One aspect of women's sports that is particularly relevant here is the presence of other kinds of outliers, specifically tall women, women with hyperandrogenism, and intersex women. In one study examining hormone levels in female athletes, for example, intersex women accounted for nearly 1% of the sample, a dramatically higher proportion than would be expected when compared to the general population, and much higher than the proportion of trans women. There is also historical evidence that intersex athletes are dramatically overrepresented in the top tiers of women's sports. The history of Castor Semenya's career is the most well-known example here. Demands for tests of her sex were very controversial when proposed, and it is generally accepted that she has an intersex condition that grants her exceptionally high testosterone. There is unlikely to be a standard of physical fitness that excludes trans women, while also including these natural outliers among cis women. But then, some people may see that as an appropriate limitation. You know, you're chasing down someone like Castor Semenya, who's, it's, you know, light years ahead, it seems. I, I think the public can see as well, sorry, like, just how, how difficult it is um, with the change of rule, but all we can do is give our best. Some who object to the participation of trans women in sports rightly point out that even after hormone replacement therapy, there are many aspects of trans women's bodies that are likely to have natural advantages over cis women's bodies. The most obvious of these is frame size, which could convey a clear advantage in sports that favor a far reach. Other supposedly fixed traits are not as well documented. I personally have not found any study on the effects of hormone therapy on muscle density, lung capacity, or heart pumping throughput, for example. With respect to center of gravity, it seems likely that trans women's center of gravity would not be the same as cis men, since hormone replacement therapy affects fat deposits and muscle size. To some people, all these unmeasured traits might represent a host of small advantages that accumulate to make trans women greatly advantaged, but the simple truth is that we don't have the research to back that up, at least not yet. For most of these, we simply don't know how much they are affected by hormone treatment. And more importantly, we don't know how much of an advantage they give in sports. Curse you, science! Why can't you just give simple answers to controversial questions? If trans female athletes do have an advantage, we haven't currently measured it. And its mere presence would probably not be enough to justify banning these athletes. The magnitude of the advantage would be relevant. Two indirect measures, testosterone and muscle mass, show post-hormonal trans women to fall within the range of their cis counterparts. Some aspects may change with hormones, such as muscle density and center of gravity, and some aspects like height do not change, but grant unmeasured physical advantages. 
As with so many scientific questions, more, more research, research is, is needed. needed. But I hope this overview has at least showcased the nuances involved. I highly recommend these two papers especially, they are quick reads and particularly interesting. And finally, with a basic understanding of the science behind us, it's time to wrap up this short series with a review of different policy options available and the pros and cons of each. I hope to see you there!